really pleased to be here. I, um, I don't speak in campuses all that often, and I feel most at home in the campus environment. So, welcome to all of you. Glad to see some protesters. I hope, hope we can have a real discussion, because I think what you're going to discover tonight is you're not going to get the normal kind of ideological humbug. I'm going to try to talk in straight language about America and kind of cut to the core of some of the issues that are dividing our country. And I'm going to give you a somewhat personal account of America, but it's a personal account fortified by a quarter century of thought and, and scholarship about America. Uh, I'm an immigrant to this country. I came to the United States at the age of 17. Um, I have one advantage over people who are born in this country, and that is that I have grown up in a different culture. And therefore, I can look at America, in a sense, through two sets of eyes. From the outside, and also from the inside. It's a little bit of a stereoscopic perspective. Now, the reason that that is relevant is because, by and large, if you're in America, you can't compare America to anything except itself. Or you can compare America to Utopia, the Garden of Eden. You will not be surprised if you do that, just like if you compare yourself to perfection, to find America falling short. But for the immigrant, this kind of utopian perspective is necessarily incomplete. And in fact, it's a little bit shallow because it's removed from history. The immigrant is forced to compare America to some other existing society, some real-world alternative. And so the immigrant, in a sense, has a comparative perspective that's missing when someone is born inside of America. Now, the remarkable thing to me about America is that for the immigrant, the immigrant is a kind of walking refutation of the dogma of cultural relativism. Cultural relativism is the idea that all cultures are basically equal. But the immigrant knows in his heart that he is a walking refutation of that dogma. Because the immigrant is voting with his feet in the most decisive way possible against his own culture and in favor of another culture. Now, I'm not talking about refugees. I'm not talking about people who are dragged here by force. I'm talking about people who choose to come. Those people are deciding against all their natural feelings. When I, when I left India, I had family, I had community, I had school, everybody I knew. I was leaving that world. And why would I do that? Unless I thought that on the balance, what was here in this country was better than what was available to me in my own country. So, the immigrant in some sense is a natural patriot. The immigrant understands in his bones or her bones something about America. And what's really remarkable is that the immigrant encounters something in America that is very uniquely American. And that phenomenon can be called um, anti-Americanism. Now, anti-Americanism is a very odd idea because there is no such thing as anti-Indianism. You can't really be anti-Indian. But then actually, to be honest, this flashes back to something that's very unique about America that immigrants discover, namely that you can actually become American in the first place. Most of you in this room can come to India. You can live there for all your life. You can work there. But you actually can't become Indian. You can't. Why? Because to be Indian, you require two things. Brown skin and Indian parents. Indianness is a function of birth and blood. But not here. In America, the Irish, the Italians, the Jews, and today the Koreans, the Haitians, the West Indians, they all come here, it takes a while, sometimes a couple of generations, but you can, in fact, become American. Why? Because being American is not a function of birth or blood. 
It's a function of assimilating to a certain way of life. Assimilating to it. Now, I mentioned anti-Americanism, and we expect anti-Americanism to come from abroad. Why? Because in a competitive world, you expect that countries will have different interests and rivalries and they'll run each other down. So to me, it's not very surprising that America is denounced by uh, a Venezuelan despot, a North Korean tyrant, an Iranian mullah. I expect that. I think one, to me, one of the most intriguing phenomena about America is that the most pungent anti-Americanism, and I'm using it here not as, not as some sort of McCarthyite smear. Anti-Americanism simply means the criticism of America. Anti-Americanism, the most effective anti-Americanism is in America, is inside of America. It comes, in fact, from some of our most prestigious colleges and universities. Now, what is this anti-Americanism an attack on? What is it actually attacking? Is it attacking the flag? Is it attacking the founders? I'm going to suggest that this anti-Americanism at its core is an attack on the immigrants. At its core, it is an attack on immigrants and immigrant values. Now, let's, let me spell that out a little bit more. And I, I'm going to swing back to that. But I want to talk first a little bit about, I want to talk a bit about the founders to set the stage historically for all this. When the founders got together in Philadelphia, the founders came up with a recipe, a formula, for what they believed was a new type of country. They call it the Novus Ordo Seclorum, a new order for the ages. And the founders believed that if this recipe were adopted, this country, America, would become, over time, the strongest and the most successful, the most prosperous country in the world. Here we are, America, 200 years later, and we're on top of the world. But our position seems really precarious. Doesn't seem like we can stay up here for that long. We seem to be, something's pulling us down. There's a drag on us in America. And so we say, where is this drag coming from? Let's look abroad. And we look abroad, we don't see any Nazis on the horizon. We don't see any communists on the horizon. Yeah, the Islamic radicals are a nuisance, but they're not an existential threat. And so I ask, where is this drag coming from? Remarkably, it appears to be coming from within. It appears to be coming from inside of America. Now, in my last film, 2016, to say a little word about that film, I, uh, when Obama was elected in 2008, I was trying to understand a little bit about Obama, and I sort of thought of Obama as being a civil rights guy. First African-American president. And uh, I thought, in fact, that Obama's ideas, his advocacy of big government, I thought, well, I understand. This is, this is the civil rights thing. If you were a young African-American growing up in the 50s or 60s in the South, the government was your friend. Who, de who desegregated the schools? Uh, who uh, enforced the Civil Rights Act of 1964? The Voting Rights Act of 1965? The Fair Housing Bill of 1968? So I thought, this is kind of where Obama gets it. He's a kind of... He's a product of the civil rights movement. So, then in an idle moment, I picked up Obama's book and I began to read it. And I realized that this whole big Obama as civil rights guy was a little bit of a fraud. It actually was not Obama. Obama's background was in Hawaii and Indonesia. His influences went as far abroad as Kenya. His autobiography is titled, Dreams from My Father. Incidentally, not dreams of my father. Dreams from my father. Meaning, these are the dreams that I, Obama, got from my dad. And so I thought, to really understand Obama, I need to go to Hawaii and go to Indonesia, go to Kenya. And so there I am in Kenya. I'm hanging out at the Obama homestead. I'm meeting his grandmother, talking to his sister. I flushed out his brother, George Obama, who was living in the Haruma slums of Nairobi. And uh, I'm chatting with all these guys, and I say to them, um, who's been down here to interview you? CNN? The New York Times? Time Magazine? They go, actually, Dinesh, no one's been down here. You're the first guy we've met. 
And I realized, with a slightly weird feeling, that this is the biggest story in the United States, the actual ideological underpinning of the President of the United States, and it is not being reported by any major newspaper, magazine, or network. So I make the film, put it in the theater, it grosses $33 million, another $10 million in DVD, it's seen by 8 million people, and yet if you were to turn on CNN or MSNBC or CBS, you would see no mention of the film whatsoever, as if it did not exist. The point I'm trying to make is that I'm actually giving you anecdotal, but rather telling evidence that we are living in a time when our national press has kind of stopped being a press. They're not actually covering the news. And we can get to why in a moment. So 2016 comes out, and then a ferocious attack on the film appears on a guy's personal website, BarackObama.com. This film is a horrible smear. This film misrepresents me. Uh, this film tells all kinds of lies. What kind of lies? This film says that um, I want to stop oil drilling in America while I'm subsidizing oil drilling in Brazil. Oh, so then I go on the web as I invite you to, Google Obama oil drilling Brazil, and you will see that Obama goes to Brazil in 2009. He's funded the Brazilian drilling program and he says, we want to support your drilling program so when you drill for oil and you have oil and you're ready to sell oil, I, America, want to stand in line to be your best customer. Quote, unquote. So, needless to say, um, I seem not to have endeared myself to our great president. And then remarkably, shortly after that, I was uh, hanging out in my apartment in New York and I, my phone rings. Look at the phone, it's a call from Kenya. I look at it, hmm, it's George Obama, the president's brother. Hello, George. <laughs> Hello, Dinesh. Why are you calling me? Uh, well, I'm at the hospital. I have a one-year-old kid who's really sick and needs health care. I don't have any money, Dinesh. Can you send me $1,000? I'm like, George, are you trying to scam me? He's like, no, 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 I'm telling the truth. I'm like, okay, hand the phone to the nurse. Hands the phone over. I verify that, in fact, this is true. And I say, George, isn't there somebody else you can call? George goes, no. No. <laughs> so here is our friend Obama prancing around the country. We are our brother's keeper. Here's his real brother in the slums of Nairobi trying to spend, a, who needs a little bit of money for health care for his sick kid and he can't count on Obama to help him. Remarkable country we live in. So, this is now reported. But is it reported in the New York Times? No. Time Magazine? No. The networks? No. Imagine if Mitt Romney had a brother living in a hut. <laughs> well, this is a little bit so this is the landscape, a little bit of an anecdotal landscape of the very strange politics of America in the 21st century. But I realized as I began to mull about all this and after Obama's re-election that the issue really isn't Barack Obama. The issue really is, is America. The issue isn't Obama's dream, it's actually the American dream. And that's what I want to talk about for a minute. Now, what is this American dream? Uh, I want to answer that question very briefly from the point of view of the immigrant. And then I want to talk about why there's been this ferocious and very clever attack on America and on the American dream. And I want to spend the bulk of my talk today trying to deal with forcefully and frontally that attack. You saw a hint of it in the trailer that I just played. So the American dream is the following, that in most cultures across the world from the beginning of time, countries and wealth have been established through conquest. Conquest is actually the way of the world. It has existed from the beginning of time. If you really look at any country, just look, name one, and ask yourself, how did we get that country? How did we get Germany? 
How did we get Thailand? How did this country get these borders? How did this guy get to rule that country? You'll discover that almost always those borders were established by conquest. That was the path that Genghis Khan took when he stormed across the plains of Central Asia. This is where the Manchu dynasty was established. Machiavelli, countries are founded in conquest and crime. That's the way of the world. And wealth was obtained by conquest. Wealth in the old world was mainly in land. So you could only get wealth by taking somebody else's wealth. It reminded me when I was a kid and I'd go to school, I'd have like 10 marbles in my pocket. And I always wanted more marbles. None of us had any money. So I realized the only way for me to go from 10 marbles to 15 marbles is to take somebody else's marbles. There's no other way. The United States, the United States is the inventor of a new idea uh, in the history of civilization. There are, there are few inventions in, in history that have made a decisive difference. Fire, the wheel, well, perhaps the most remarkable invention is the invention of the idea of wealth creation. Wealth creation. Because wealth creation means that you can go from 10 marbles to 15 marbles without taking anybody else's marbles. You can create wealth. Or to use an American phrase, you can make money. Make money. Very interesting word, to make money, as if money can be generated out of nothing. And out of this, this prosperity dream of America, the immigrant has sees a bigger dream that's bigger than money. Money's part of it. I mentioned in one of my books I got to have an acquaintance in India who's been trying to come to America for a long time, unable to get a visa. So finally I said to him, I said, why are you so eager to come to America? He goes, Dinesh, I really want to move to a country where the poor people are fat. And look, yeah, I know all about diets and all that, but the truth of it is that in America, look at India. The poor people basically can barely walk. They look terrible. Prosperity is part of the American dream, but it's not the main part. For me, I grew up in a middle class family. My dad was an engineer, my mom a housewife. So, I grew up without great luxury, but not lacking for anything. So if you were to ask me materially, am I better off in America, I'd say, sure, I am. But it's not a radical difference. My life has changed more in other ways. The main way that my life has changed is that in the United States, I've been able to do with my life something that would be virtually impossible for me to do in India, and probably in most places in the world. What I'm trying to say is, in, in, in America, your destiny isn't given to you, but constructed by you. In America, you are to a degree that's unprecedented historically, and unprecedented if you look around the world. You are the architect of your own future. You're in the driver's seat of your own life. Now, what does this mean? It doesn't mean that I can be Michael Jordan. It doesn't mean that. I'm limited by my aptitude, I'm limited by my height, I'm limited by being male, I can't enter the Miss World contest, though I may try. Uh, but within those constraints, my important decisions, where to live, who to love, who to marry, what to become, what to believe, what religion to practice, these decisions are up to me, the individual, to make for myself. So to me, this is the powerful idea of America, which is the idea of the self-directed life, and the idea of a life where your worth is determined not by where you came from, by what, but by what you do. By what you do. You make your own life. Now, let me suggest that it is this extremely powerful idea that has actually built America that is the object of frustration, venom, hatred, envy, and miserable denunciation by a very powerful group of Americans who hate this idea and want to bring down this core of the American dream. Why would anybody be against this idea? 
and why would they want to bring it down? First of all, I want to emphasize that the core reason that people come to America is not for religious liberty, but rather to make your own life. Yeah, sure, some of the early founders came for religious liberty. Actually, even they didn't. They came to prevent the religious persecution of themselves, but they were pretty happy to impose religious persecution on others. So they were not, in fact, advocates of religious liberty per se. But the bulk of people who have come from, um, to America over the centuries have come for the same reason. They have come as settlers to make a new life for themselves. It is the immigrant who defines America. It's the immigrant values who define America. Which now brings me to the theft critique of America. The theft critique of America. So what is the core what is the core of the argument against America? The core of the argument against America is that the wealth of America is based on stealing. That the wealth of America is based on theft. Not just the country's wealth, our wealth, my wealth, your parents' wealth, has been illicitly taken from other people who it really belongs to. Now, this, I believe, is the moral force behind, I'm going to say, Obamaism. And let me spell that out for just a moment, the theft critique. The theft critique actually is very powerful. It has a historical component, and it has a contemporary component. What's the historical component? The United States stole the country from the Indians. The whole country was stolen. Theft. The white man stole for 250 years the unpaid labor of African Americans. Slavery. Theft. Why? Because slavery is essentially the ripping off of people's labor. You don't pay them. You make them work for free. And you take the product of that labor, which as Abraham Lincoln said is, you work, I eat. That's the essence of slavery. Theft. The United States took half of Mexico in the Mexican War. Theft. Adding states like California, Colorado, Utah, even Oregon, California. Almost doubling the size of the United States. Theft. American foreign policy today, the progressives say, based on theft. Why are we in the Middle East? Oil. America, you notice, never invades countries like Haiti or the Congo. Why? Because they don't really have any oil. They don't have any oil. So a foreign policy is mercenary. And finally, capitalism, which is sort of the biggest sore spot of all, the free market system, capitalism is based on theft. Why? Because wealth according to Senator Warren, according to Obama. You didn't build that. Really? Who did? Society did. After all, if you're a successful entrepreneur, you took the public roads, you went to the public schools, you benefited from the firefighters and the policemen. Society created wealth. But then the greedy entrepreneur comes in and steals it, the profit. But it's not his. And therefore, the government has every right to confiscate it. The government isn't actually taking your stuff. The stuff isn't yours in the first place. Now, right away, we notice a little bit of a puzzle. First of all, this theft critique in any other context would appear a bit strange. Imagine if I, my daughter is 19 years old, she's a freshman in college. Imagine if I were to say to her, young lady, you got very high scores on your SAT, but you didn't build that. She goes, really dad, why not? I go, well you took the public roads to go to the SAT. She goes, so? I go, you were provided with police protection. She goes, so? I go, well, had you been born in an orphanage in Thailand, you would not have had these opportunities. Moreover, moreover, if the sun had not been eight light minutes away from the earth, 
you would have either frozen or baked, there would be no human life, and you wouldn't have these high SAT scores. <laughs> Your SAT performance is dependent on all these other factors. You owe the universe big time. Now, honestly, if I were to say this, she would think I was nuts. But yet, in the capitalist context, it seems like kind of a knockdown argument. Wealth is created by society. Now, what's really remarkable is that this tough critique is made against people who don't know how to answer it. The typical entrepreneur is running a business. He's not thinking about the moral logic of capitalism. And so when some very smart professor of romance languages at Amherst confronts him, he doesn't know what to say. But this is the theme of my new America film. So it's a film about America. It's a patriotic film. It's coming out on the 4th of July. But at the core of it is a deep and I think very troubling intellectual question, which is, is America a force for good or is America a force for evil? This is not a debate about American exceptionalism, by the way. The claim is that either America is exceptionally good or America is exceptionally bad. Both sides are affirming American exceptionalism, but exceptionalism of an opposite variety. Now, how does one begin to think about these things? First of all, I want to put you on alert that most of you are probably quite convinced of the theft critique I outlined earlier because you are actually the product of an extremely bad education. You actually know very little about American history. You actually have a deep reservoir of ignorance about American history. And this is actually a very interesting speaker's rule I'm adopting, which violates every rule in the speaker's handbook. Never insult the audience. But I'm actually not insulting you at all, because your ignorance is not due to you. Your ignorance is because from the time you were three, from the time you stepped into preschool, you were taught a morality tale about American history. And this morality tale was taught to you by people who have an agenda. They're teaching it to you for a purpose. And the morality tale is very easy to excavate because it actually has a marvelously selective view of American history. In fact, it skips over huge swaths of American history, just zooming into little details that are supposed to produce a certain emotional effect in you. So the typical American history in high school sort of kind of goes like this. There was really this horrible man, Christopher Columbus, who came to America, but he really went too far, and he created slavery, and he created oppression, and then there were the American founders, who were a bunch of hypocrites, because they said all men are created equal, but they had slaves, and then there was a civil war, which really wasn't really about slavery until the marvelous civil rights movement, fast forward a hundred years, soldier of truth, Martin Luther King, and then me, rah, rah, rah. I've given you kind of the high school summary of American history. Right? In which, in which names like Martin Luther King, Sojourner Truth, rank prominent. You have to know them, otherwise you don't know anything. But if somebody were to say to you other names, Madam C.J. Walker, Frederick Douglass, The Gilded Age, Calvin Coolidge, suddenly you're like, who was that guy? What did he have to do with anything? Now, <laughs> right, so Calvin Coolidge went here, and of course I'm staying at the, I'm staying at the um, Lord Jeffrey. So, let's talk about Lord Jeffrey for a moment. This is part of what I would call the morality tale. When the white man came to America, large numbers of American Indians died. About 80% of the entire Indian population of the Americas perished. You heard Charmaine Whiteface, the leader of the Lakota Sioux Nation, genocide, genocide. Actually, no, no. 
The white man brought with himself innumerable diseases. Malaria, smallpox, tuberculosis, and on and on, to which the Indians had no immunities. Now the reason I mentioned Lord Jeffrey is that if you dig into the leftist literature, well, yes, there was Lord Jeffrey who gave smallpox infected blankets to the Indians. Actually, that's highly dubious, whether that actually happened. It is the one case in all of American history of even an allegation of a deliberate contamination. This so-called possibility metamorphoses into a probability. Pretty soon it's a certainty. Pretty soon the entire white man for 200 years was from perpetrating genocidal killings of the Indians. In short, pure bullshit. Pure bullshit. In short, the white man unintentionally brought with him diseases which he himself got from somebody else. A hundred years earlier, one third of the population of Europe was wiped out by the bubonic and pneumonic plagues which came from Asia. The white man had no immunities and he perished in huge numbers. Nobody calls that genocide because it isn't. If you want to talk sense, genocide requires an intention to obliterate a people. Now, let's back up for a moment. <laughs> let's back up for a moment. By the way, I do think it's very interesting. One of the techniques of ignorance is to laugh. Uh, if you read the Republic, Socrates says, laughter? Yes, exactly. Laughter is a form of ignorance. Because you'll have time to challenge me. You, you'll have time to challenge me. And I invite you to. You'll be stepping into the lion's den. But that's okay. <laughs> I invite you to. All right. <laughs> All right. Genocide. Let me say a word about this. So, why, why, if this was not genocide, would anybody want to teach that it is? What is the reason for that? Why would somebody want to lie to American students about their own history? Why would people try to tell a nastier story about America than the reality of the situation? Now I want to shift and uh, give you a little bit of a different type of argument that puts all of this in, in a clear light. Imagine a guy who is um, sweeping office floors for a living or adding up numbers and his home is underwater and he owes money on his credit card bills and he's leaving work to go home and he's kind of despondent, works hard and then he looks into a restaurant and he notices all these people ordering $30 entrees and drinking wine and laughing and a couple of limousines outside and he looks in there and he goes, what the heck? What's going on here? Why did those guys have all that? And why do I have less? They work hard, I'm sure, but I work hard also. My point is, this is when the American begins to feel the lowest of all human emotions. Namely, envy. Envy. Now, envy is a very remarkable vice. It's unlike lust or greed. It's a very secretive vice. And it comes accompanied with a couple of other crushing feelings. First of all, just to say, that guy has more and I have less, that's not envy. Because you could say, I need to work harder. I need to try to have as much as that guy has by starting my own business. That's not envy. Envy is when you say, I wish I could have more, but if not, I would rather he have less. I would like to pull myself up, but since I don't know how, I would rather pull that guy down. Envy is not jealousy, by the way. Jealousy is a noble emotion related to justice. Why? Because jealousy means anger at being deprived of what's yours. Envy is a demand that you get something that you're not entitled to, that's not yours. Othello is jealous because he believes wrongly, as it turns out, that his wife is actually betraying him. Iago is envious for no reason. Iago says of Cassio, he has a daily beauty in his life that makes me ugly. But why does Cassio's beauty make him ugly? It doesn't. But envy is that 
lowest and most secretive of vices, and it is in fact the operating emotion of American progressivism. Envy. Now the envious guy is frustrated, he's angry, he's bitter. Worst of all, he begins to hate the guy who has more. And just as bad, he begins to hate himself. Why? Why does the envious person hate himself? He hates himself because, in fact, in an aristocratic society, you might have envy, but you wouldn't have self-hatred. The serf may want to be an aristocrat, but the serf isn't going to hate himself because he knows that his serfdom is the product of accident. He just got the short end of the straw. It was luck. But in a society which is based on merit, it's kind of like an Amherst, if you get an A or you get a D, it's not because you were a serf, it's because you were an idiot. It's because you wrote a bad paper. Sorry, you suck. <laughs> so the point I'm trying to make is that the guy who looks in the window feels hatred, but the hatred turns on himself because he has to realize, I suck. I could have started that business, but I didn't. I didn't have the brains, I didn't have the effort. And so we have a smoldering segment of our population sunken in envy and resentment and self-hatred. And then along come two visitors to see him. One is the intellectual and the other is the community organizer. One is the, one is the college professor and the other is the politician. Unknown to that American, these are the two most envious, resentful groups in America. They are the most bitter, they are the most petty, and they are the nastiest people on the planet. As a group, there are individual exceptions. Now why is that the case? Why would politicians and why would intellectuals in this country feel that way? Because this is an entrepreneurial society that awards rewards to people who create value for consumers. Ancient societies had intellectuals, men of letters, they were at the top. They were the people who were at court. And they mastered, they had a product that they produced. It was called words, usually words of flattery, at which the intellectuals were really good at. And as a result, they had a lot of power. But when capitalism came along, all the French costumes had to come off, all the men of letters had to go away, and they had to start publishing journals and teaching in universities. And university professors are prayed pretty well. As I walk around here, I see some BMWs, see some nice houses. And yet, if you talk to this professor of sociology at Amherst, and you just begin to tickle him a little bit, you'll, be, you'll hear something like this. You know what? I'm really pissed off. Why? Because that fat Rotarian with a gold chain on his chest makes $2 million selling pest control or term life insurance. In other words, from the professor's point of view, he's the most educated, he's the smartest guy in America. And yet these other guys who seem much less smart are doing so much better. Why? And so the professor begins to feel something must be wrong with the society that awards rewards in this way. We need to rearrange society so my group, the thinkers, the intellectuals, come to power. And the politician feels the same way. And so we have a tripartite alliance between the intellectual, who basically spins the intellectual story, genocide, and then the politician, who basically comes in to complete the transaction. The com politician is saying to the average American who feels lost, resentful, angry, self-hating, hey guy, you're not envious. You're righteously indignant. You're actually not upset at yourself. You're aggrieved because those guys have been stealing from you. What they have is really yours. But don't worry, you don't have to do a whole bunch. In fact, you have to do only one thing. Vote for me. If you vote for me, I will go and take their stuff and I will give some of it to you. Now, you find a wonderful harmony of interests. Three envious groups coming together and converting their jealousy, their hatred, their self-hatred into the big banner of social justice. Social justice. Now, this I believe is a short psychological summary of our state of American politics. And it puts us in a remarkable situation because the strength of America 
as I said, is the energy and enterprise of the immigrants. I said earlier the attack is on the immigrants. Why? Why are the immigrants being attacked? No one dares attack the immigrants because they don't have guts. But who took the land from the Indians? Was it the big aristocrats who were in Boston? No, they stayed in Boston. It was the settlers who went out west. They took the land from the Indians. Who stole the labor of the blacks? Well, it was the planters. Everybody who bought a cotton shirt benefited from slavery. Who took, who took Mexico? It was not rich guys and pantaloons who went down to Mexico to fight. It was really poor guys and immigrants who went down there, defeated the Mexicans, took Mexico City, and then gave half the country back. The immigrants are actually the ones who have committed, allegedly, all these crimes. So the attack on America is disguised as an attack on the rich, George Washington. I'm giving you the sort of Howard Zinn propaganda version. The rich, George Washington. But the real attack is on the settlers who came here with nothing, who fought their way across the continent, who built the Continental Railroad, who built enterprises, who farmed the fields, who, who serviced the military, defeated Mexico. These are the guys who have actually made America and made the American dream. They might be bad guys, but these aren't rich guys, and many of them aren't white. And they certainly weren't considered white when they got here. All right, I've, I'm out of time. So I want to say that a word about films. I used to be, for most of my career, a writer, a speaker. I spent a lot of time speaking on campus. I don't speak that much anymore. And uh, Films are a very powerful way to take these big ideas and allow the American people to experience them on a, on a wide scale. Experience them not only intellectually, but also emotionally. And so our America film that's coming out in June, it's a patriotic film, as I said, but it's not rah-rah patriotism. America, love it or leave it. If you don't like it, get out of here. Edmund Burke once said, to love our country, our country should be lovely. I believe as an immigrant that America is lovely. I believe that the progressive attack on America is rooted in lies and bad faith and dirty emotions that are so beneath the surface that you won't admit them to yourself. And so you put on this hypocritical pose of social justice which you can't defend and deep down you know is not even true. But it satisfies something in the low end of the, of the psyche, what Lincoln might have called the lower angels of our nature the demons of our psyche, the desire to take stuff that doesn't belong to you, the desire to pull people down who have earned their way up, the desire to, to calumnize and traduce people who have put a lot on the line for this country. Some of you in your banners talk about my writings about slavery. It's really remarkable when we learn the history of anti-slavery in this country. We hear about the Underground Railroad, we hear about Thaddeus Stevens, we hear about the abolitionists. Now, quite frankly, if you're Frederick Douglass, how hard is it to be anti-slavery? In every civilization, there's one group that has always opposed slavery, and that's called slaves. Slaves are against slavery. That doesn't require any explanation. The remarkable thing about slavery to me is Abraham Lincoln's remark, as I would not be a slave, so I would not be a master. That's very interesting. Lincoln could have been a master, but he doesn't want to be. He doesn't want to be a slave, we get that, but he doesn't want to be a master either. That is something that compels surprise. In the Civil War, 300,000 northern white guys died to end an institution that African Americans were not able to end on their own. If Americans paid a price for slavery, Shouldn't those lives be counted as part of that atonement? Of course they should be. But in the society of political correctness and chants and gasps and derisive laughter, it's very difficult to face our own history, our own truth. Because this truth has now become manipulated for political gain. To say something that's true is to go against the morality tale. And if you take down the morality tale, you can't keep ripping people off by creating shame in them. So the essence of our politics is to try to create among young people shame so that when other people come to take your stuff, you'll happily provide it. <laughs> because you'll be like, wow, 
Yeah, I'm descended from Nazi war criminals. I'm in possession of stolen goods. True, the papers being submitted are forgeries. But nevertheless, you will buy the lie because it's been drummed into you. Drummed into you. So part of what our film's going to do, which I think is going to be very eye-opening, is, is provide a little, I'll call it, hidden history. It's not denying the things I said earlier. It's just filling in those rather large 70 and 100 year gaps. Because when you begin to fill out the picture, somehow suddenly, just as when you take a painting and you start putting things in, suddenly when you've completed it, it looks totally different. The assessment of America is different. And I'm hoping that as, as we do that, the people who have been propagandized, even young people, even some of you, who are progressive to the bone, might be willing to turn your hypercritical lens that you're so good at turning upon outsiders, upon yourself, and look at your own motives, and look at your own place in America, and begin to say that, you know what? However much I bitch and complain, and whatever I hear from my professors, at the end of the day, compared to every other existing society, America indeed is lovely. Thank you very much. I haven't read a lot of your works, I just know a little bit. Why are you uh, so against homosexuality? Okay, it's really important to separate the two sentences you just uttered. I haven't read a lot of your works, i.e., I don't really know what I'm talking about, but undeterred, you proceed. What have you got against homosexuality? Do you know for a fact that I have anything against homosexuality? Uh, that's what I've read before. Read or heard? Uh, read. Uh, you, did you read it on the Socialist Nation website? No, when I Googled it, it was the first thing that came up when I Googled your name. <laughs> okay. All right. Look, I appreciate that. Um, I, I have written 13 books. Uh, I have said very little on this topic. Uh, I have written, uh, probably what you're referring to is a book I wrote called The Enemy at Home which attempted to explain a very remarkable phenomenon, which is why it is the case in the Muslim world today that America is so effectively portrayed as the great Satan. America historically had very favorable views in the Muslim world going back to the 50s. So I was trying to explain this phenomenon. And part of what I was saying is that the rise of cultural liberalism in America since the 60s, has given the radical Muslims a powerful propaganda weapon. They're able to say, we're shameless, your women are whores. They're able to say, these people don't believe in God, they kick God out of the public square, they promote gay marriage. So I was actually describing a foreign policy phenomenon, which is the use of propaganda in the Muslim world to convince people to hate America. Now, quite honestly, if you were to read that, you can agree or disagree. But to reduce that analysis to why are you against homosexuality is to me intellectually irresponsible. No, but the question and not, was, are you hold on, don't shout from the audience. You're welcome to come up yeah, and stand in line next. Um, but what I'm trying to say is, what I'm trying to say is, I'm happy to address analysis of something I've written, but this seems to me the distortion of my views. So okay? What's the analysis? Yes or no? Analysis of what? Are you against homosexuality? Are you okay with it? Uh, you engage in it? <laughs> no, I don't engage in it. Okay. Uh, I believe homosexuals have equal rights, the same as everybody else. Okay, cool. Okay. Um, you want to follow up or are you done? No, I, I was just wondering, so do you have a problem with gay marriage? Well, I don't have a problem with it. Let me, let me, let me say what I wrote about it. Let me say what I wrote about it. Um, the gay marriage issue basically, um, I think, is a battle for social acceptance. That we're at a stage of our history where there's a huge debate about social acceptance of homosexuality. And I think gay marriage is a surrogate for that debate. Uh, fundamentally, I don't think it's even about marriage. I think it's about society saying it's okay. And marriage is the symbol of that, of that battle. Look. Um, historically in this country, marriage has had all kinds of restrictions. The very word, marriage. Uh, you have to be an adult. You have to be male and female. That's the second restriction. You have to be two people. Can't be three or five. 
Um, so these are all the fence posts that define marriage historically. Now here's the point. Very often the defense of gay marriage is consenting adults. Right? Or love. But the moment you step back and think about it, you realize that if that's true, then none of the other restrictions about marriage work either. In fact, incest is often between consenting adults and a grown-up brother and sister. Uh, polygamy can be between consenting adults. Who's to say that people who are, can't love more than one person or many? The point I'm trying to get at is there hasn't really been in our culture a real re-examination of what we mean by marriage. Now, my view as a conservative is that when you have a social institution, it's kind of like if you see a fence and you go, let's take that fence down. I always say, before you do that, ask yourself, why was that fence put up? If you have no idea why it was put up, it's probably, you're probably not the guy to go kick it down. But do you think it was put up for religious reasons? No. <laughs> is, it, is it rooted in morals or? The basic idea of marriage is this. <coughs> in any society, it would be incredibly difficult, expensive, and unmanageable if the children of that society, a la Plato's Republic, were turned over to the state, right? Imagine there are millions of children born in America. Imagine if we said to them, the government needs to now look after them, feed them, clothe them, etc." That happens all the time. So yeah. in America, do you think those people don't have the right to have kids? No, 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 so no, no. Don't take this in the wrong direction. Here's what I'm trying to say. It is highly beneficial for society to have the parents who bear the kids assume the responsibility of raising them. It's a very difficult responsibility. It's very thankless. And in Western society, it's incredibly ungrateful. It's ungrateful because in other societies, like India, your parents look after you, and when you get old, when they get old, you look after them. So the cycle is completed. There's a cycle of reciprocity. In American society, parents look after children, and then children basically tell them to screw off. Think about that. So parenthood is an incredibly unreciprocated sacrifice. It's one way. And you're just hopeful that your kids will look after their kids. But they're not going to do a whole lot for you. They're not even going to look after your retirement. You need Social Security. So you see where I'm going with this? Where I'm going with this is that marriage was set up the way it is for a reason. Namely, to give special privilege to families that have nurtured, at tremendous cost to themselves and sacrifice children over many generations. Now, when I look at the gay marriage debate, to me it's, it's embarrassing, it's shallow. It is framed entirely in the thin logic of discrimination. As if there was a pure equation between the civil rights movement, the feminist movement, and the gay rights movement, as if there weren't important distinctions between race, which is biological, Gender, which is far more complex, rooted in biology, but also a social construct. Obviously, gender identity, somewhat biological, fluidly social. All these things are incredibly complex, and to put a crude equal sign between them, I think actually kind of misses the thicker social meaning of these things. So, again, I've never written about any of this. I'm just literally spouting off from the top of my head. But I'm trying to give you a sense. I'm trying to give you a sense um, of why there's more to this, I believe, than simply a religious bigotry issue. Okay. Nice. Okay. Sure. Hi. Actually, I want to I wanna tell you that I wasn't laughing because I didn't agree with you. I was actually laughing because I agree with a lot of stuff you said. Um, so you got that one wrong. Not everybody laughs for that reason. I'm not a Republican. I'm not a Democrat. I think you're both full of shit, and I'm not saying you by yourself, right? I'm not even saying you. You said a lot of things that, you know, I can really uh, believe, right? I'm not sure what school you went to, though, because they're still teaching that Christopher Columbus was, uh, like, this great explorer, so I, I'm not sure. Did you get, okay, I, I never got that other one. I'm, try, I'm learning that now. So, um, that's what's great about this country, right, that I can get up here and just say, that I don't agree with your 
um, assessment of history. I don't agree with your assessment of slavery. I think that I do agree that definitely the Europeans brought a lot of a disease, right? That it, people died not because they brought them, like they said, oh my God, let's trade some smallpox and drop it on a blanket so we can kill those Indians. Yeah, it didn't happen that way. But I don't agree with your uh, assessment about history, about that things weren't done on purpose, you know, to. Um, steal from people so that others can become wealthy. And, you know, the, the gap between um, the very wealthy and those who don't have access to resources is greater today. There's statistics, and I don't need statistics. I kind of grew up that way. And, um, you know, I went to college and, and um, do my master's degree now, and um, there's a lot of great things about this country. But I have to say that um, I think because you said we were confused, whoever was laughing, and because we don't know our history. I think I actually do have a good grasp of my history and the history of this country. Um, I don't think that you have a great grasp of the history of this country. Um, however, you do have a perspective, right? You have a perspective, and um, which is erroneous, because it's not really helping. Um, create a better life for people in this country and around the world. And I do think America is bad. And when I say America, I'm talking about the government. I'm talking about Democrats and Republicans. You're both capitalists. When somebody says that Obama is a socialist, I'm like, what the hell are they talking about? A socialist, really? Oh my God, do you know what a socialist is? Obama is like not a fucking socialist. Hello? He's full of shit too. Right? You're all a bunch of capitalists. People who, well-intentioned, I think, and you're probably not a bad person. I don't think so. I don't get that vibe from you, right? But I really believe that unless we both, unless people come together to look at the reality of people's lives in this country and around the world, and how most people live in absolute impoverishment, how most people don't have access like to the water in that bottle that you're freaking drinking, right? That people have to pay for their water that they can't even like collect rainwater. I mean, let's get real here, all right? So I'm gonna watch your film, because you said it's not like, yay, Patriot, thank God, because you know, I don't know why you did it for the 4th of July, that's so patriotic, but anyway, I'm gonna watch it, because I wanna learn more about other people's perspectives. And, um, and I guess that's all I'm gonna say right now. And uh, so yeah, people sometimes laugh because they agree, right? And I don't know, I was going to say something, but I'm not, because I think you're, you're not such a bad guy. I feel like a bit like the, the mosquito in the nudist colony. I'm not quite sure where to begin. Uh, but uh, I guess I won't. <laughs> Let's just move on. I'll, take that, I'll just take that as a statement. Uh, good evening, Mr. D'Souza. My name is Tommy Raskin. I'm a freshman here. I'm in the Amherst Political Union. It's one of the groups that put on this event. Uh, we want to thank you again for coming out. Um, after World War II, the white middle class soared to prosperity as a result of bills like the GI Bill. And um, African Americans who were coming home from war didn't get those benefits simply because they were African American. The US Department of Veteran Affairs denied African Americans access to those benefits simply because of their race. And uh, you are correct in saying that no one today dealt with that particular issue. With that being said, however, there was wealth amassed um, as a result of those programs that still exists today. And w when I think of your example about an individual who works as a janitor and sees people dining in a beautiful cafe walking home from work, I, I want to ask you, do you think any of that indignation, given certain circumstances, might actually be justified simply because there have been systematic blocks in people's way throughout American history, not ending with slavery, not ending with the Jim Crow laws, uh, not ending, some would say even today, we still have housing discrimination. All of which is to say, um, 
you found that during the Cold War era, there was a massive boom in uh, the, the white middle class's prosperity, and you just didn't have that among African Americans, not because they weren't meritorious, but because they were discriminated against. Uh, that's my first question. If you don't mind, I just want to ask you one more about the enemy from within. If you look at pages 48 and 49 of the 9-11 Commission report, you find that the reasons as to why there's this torrent of anti-Americanism in the Islamic world has absolutely nothing to do with homosexuality. It's because the U.S. has been over there in Saudi Arabia with U.S. bases in the Arabian Peninsula after the first Gulf War. We instituted sanctions against the Iraqi people, which led to the deaths of thousands upon thousands of people children. before the uh, children before the U.S. invasion of Iraq. People over there are mad that we've supported despots all throughout the Middle East, like our support for Hosni Mubarak in Egypt. Don't you think that that might be a more compelling explanation as to why there's this torrent of anti-Americanism in so many parts of the Middle East? Thank you. Amen. All right. Hallelujah. Well, first of all, <laughs> Iraq, I thought, had nothing to do with 9-11. When Bush inv invaded Iraq, there was a chorus that said, the Iraqis have nothing to do with 9-11. Why are you invading Iraq? But now apparently I hear from you that the long effect of sanctions from the first Gulf War was in fact creating uh, mi Islamic militancy in Iraq. Actually, I think you're wrong about that. I agree with the view that Iraq had nothing to do with 9-11. So here's what I'm getting at. I don't really want to, I've read the 9-11 report cover to cover, including pages 48 and 49. Um, Bin Laden himself issued an open letter to America dated 2002. You might discover the motives of Bin Laden a little better from reading Bin Laden than from reading the 9-11 report. Uh, right after the 9-11, Bush called the terrorists cowards. There might have been a lot of things, but they weren't that. Very often, if you want to understand people from another culture, Listen to them. Don't just listen to your own prejudices. So I agree, it may be discomforting for you to think that the radical Muslims are upset, not merely at American soldiers in Saudi Arabia, but also about the massive spread of American popular culture into the rest of the world. Right now, there is a powerful idea going across Asia, Africa, and South America, which says modernization, yes, westernization, no. This is not Muslims. These are Hindus and Confucians, and these are all kinds of people who say, we want modernity, we want technology, we want cell phones, we want iPads, but there's a lot of things about Western culture we do not like. When the Sochi Olympics were happening recently, there was a quotation attributed to Putin where he said, gays are welcome, but leave our children untouched. I mention this only to suggest that this is a widespread attitude in non-Western cultures. You may not like it, but part of education is being willing to listen to things that you don't like and trying to figure out what you do about them. So the worst kind of ethnocentrism is to project your own fantasies about other cultures onto them. So you don't want America to invade Iraq? Don't pretend that's what upsets the Muslims. That's what upsets you. So protest all you want. You don't like the World Trade Meetings? Go protest against them. But you won't see a lot of Indians and Chinese protesting over there, except maybe Arundhati Roy. But the truth of the matter is most Indians and Chinese like foreign companies and stand in long lines when Nike and Oracle hire. And the people from the Indian Institutes of Technology run to those companies to give them their resumes. So again, the, the prejudices of leftist Americans don't all always correspond with the welfare of third world peoples. And that applies to Muslims as well. Now let me answer your other question. Which was, remind me. Yeah, uh, well. <laughs> the first question. Yeah, yeah, uh, the first question. And I just want to say in response to the second one, I wasn't commenting about globalization from a corporate standpoint. I was talking very specifically about militaristic endeavors. With respect to the first, I, I was saying that after World War II, there were benefits available to white veterans that were not I got available it. to. Okay. You're talking about the present effects of past advantage, right? Correct. Okay. So, 
Let me ask, let, let, you know, we're, in a, we're in, a, in a very smart college. It's worth pursuing a discussion on these points. So there are Americans whose present benefits are due to past advantage. By the way, this past advantage, which is often assumed to continue with the white man, actually goes all the way back to the beginning. The American Indians who were here first, right, had a huge advantage. We presume that they owned the whole country. Now, how do you, by the way, let's pause for a moment. How do you get to own a country? If, if you have Cain and Abel, and Abel is a shepherd, and Cain is a farmer, and Cain says, okay, I'm not going to put a fence around the whole world. I own it, because I'm the only guy here. You're a shepherd. And my descendants will now inherit the earth, and anybody who shows up is a usurper. Rousseau says that the first guy who puts up a fence and claims he owns something is a, is a con man. So the American Indians came. They happened to be first. They came in a bunch of tribes. The Navajos who got the land took it from the Hopi or the Pueblo. Their law of the jungle was conquest. That's how they got the land. There's a big fight about the Black Hills that I cover in the film. The, the, the Sioux who got the Black Hills took it from the Cheyenne. So when we say, oh, give us the land back, are you going to turn around and give it back to the Cheyenne? Oh, no. It's ours. Really? How come you own it forever now? So what I'm getting at here is history is very complicated. Let me give you an example of India so we can look at this at the level of theory. Okay? India was invaded by the British and earlier by the Afghans and the Persians and the Mongols. So you have all these successive invasions, right? Are you actually saying that you believe in a rule of social justice today that says globally, let's look at this as a, as a global rule of justice, I'm going to figure out whose ancestors did what to whom and I'm going to return goods that were illicitly taken from the beginning to the people who had it originally. Do you believe that that's a viable way to organize our society? Do you believe, if I can ask you a direct question, that you are the beneficiary of white privilege here at Amherst? I, I yes do. Or no? Well, yeah, and I'll, pause. I'll, okay. Uh, well. If you are, <laughs> if you are, can I ask you a further question? Oh, okay, yeah, but I, I, I don't just say it in a sort. I, I don't say it in a self-flagellating and self-aggrandizing way. Hold well, on. Uh, okay, I, go on. You know what? I, I really try not to. I'm simply saying that because you asked me. Really, I, I view the recognition of one's privilege as an impetus to change things. So I don't just say I have white privilege. I try to help those who have not benefited from really? such privilege. Really? How? I, hold on, hold on. Let, let's pursue this for a moment. Sure. You say, let's this is actually very important because there's, okay. there's a psychology here, sure. right? Well, you see, here's, I'm going to answer your question, but I, and I'm really not trying to attack you. I'm not trying to be provocative. I just find that often, I think the essence of much of this discourse surrounds, uh, surrounds hypocrisy. And you're trying to, maybe you're trying to demonstrate that I'm a hypocrite. I, I say I benefit from white privilege, yet I don't actually do anything. But I, I'm going to, I'm going to backpedal and say that ultimately I think what the greatest vice is, is cruelty. And um, I, I'm not going to, I, I don't want to be hypocritical. So to answer your question, I'll start in high school. Um, I, and I mean, do, do people want to hear this, or yes. do, do we? Educated. Look, let me say where I'm going with this because I think you're. I, All right, well. well all of which is to say, I, it's not like I picked anyone out to help uh, based on the color of their skin, but I was a tutor for people who tended to be low income when I was in high school. Um, I suppose that that would be one, one direct answer to your question, because oftentimes disparate educational opportunities are grounded in disparate economic systems, or systems that produce disparate economic outcomes. So that's okay. one way that I would combat it on an individual level. All right. Here's what I'm getting with this, okay? One of the benefits of a good education of reading people like Nietzsche is you begin to understand how deep the human desire is to, for moral self-exculpation. Moral self-exculpation. Now, you say, and I didn't say this, you said this, I'm a beneficiary of illicit white privilege, okay? Illicit? Well, isn't all white privilege illicit? Ill is it deserved? Well, in this, I mean, in this current system, there is legality. I mean, that illicit means immoral. 
Okay. Then, Immoral white okay. privilege. Yeah. Okay. So then if I were to say to you, there are surely many deserving minorities who would like to come to Amherst but have the inherited disadvantage of American history. Therefore, since you are an acknowledged beneficiary of illicit privilege, would you be willing to step aside voluntarily, putting your own moral mouth where your uh, self-proclaimed virtue is and give your seat, your seat, not my seat. I realize you may be super generous with other people's advantages and favor affirmative action so other white kids who apply to Amherst are turned away to open spaces for minorities. But I'm not talking about you acting out your virtue on them. I'm talking about you acting out your virtue on you. Mm -hmm. Are you willing to give up your illicit seat that you don't deserve here at Amherst to make room for a disadvantaged minority, yes or no? Okay, well, let me start here. I don't know how you got on the topic of affirmative action. By following I, the logic of I, your... No, no, I, I never said specifically that I think that race-based affirmative action is the best way to rectify um, the systems Why of injustice. That, Why I'm don't sorry? you practice it by stepping out? And, and why don't you go to the registrar tomorrow and tell him you want to withdraw from Amherst? Are you listening to what he just said? Get off, yeah. Tell I'm him listening. Think about it. Go ahead. Okay, well, but, I mean, I, look, I, I'm only continuing to engage because you continue to engage with me, and I, I do want to hear other people's questions. But in response to that, again, what you're trying to demonstrate is that everyone's hypocritical. As someone once said that we're all, we're all dirty up to our arms, right? We're not all perfect. None of us is perfectly morally consistent. Now, I've said absolutely nothing about affirmative action. The fact is that I believe everyone in this room is hypocritical to some degree. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't strive for a more just and equitable system entirely. Um, there have been points in my life in which I have given up uh, some of the privileges with, it, with which I have been endowed simply because I realized that it wasn't the right thing to do. At the same time, I think everyone needs to survive and that we, ex we understand that we exist in an imperfect system and that we have to conduct our business in such a way as to not only adhere to our moral standards, but to the standards imposed upon us by the system in which we live. And I, I think that we have to be generous to people in their efforts to not be hypocritical and then do their best. But I don't think that we should totally throw away the idea that we shouldn't have those standards at all. Um, and so that's my response to you, but I would still like a response to my question regarding the inequity that I talked about uh, with the uh, U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. That is wealth that is passed down, and it's documentable wealth. The same way that the wealth created, or the wealth stolen as a product of slavery was also documentable wealth. We have numbers that demonstrate precisely how much wealth was stolen, and that's money that in some way could be given back. Now, if we're saying that it's absolutely impossible Possible to give that money back because it's too hard to trace. We'd have to uh, give money to the African tribes. We'd have to give money to people who are no longer exist. That's absolutely fine, but we have to understand that we haven't really come to terms with that injustice that's been perpetrated. And if we are admitting that no one um, that no one is perfectly entitled to absolutely everything that their uh, ancestors were, uh, had stolen from them, then we also have to accept that there are people today who benefit from the fact that their parents and grandparents profited from this immoral system. And, and the way to deal with that is with a social safety net that enables everyone to thrive. I'll, I'll, I'll leave you there. Great. <clears throat> yes. Well. The, the core of the American system, this will actually answers your question directly, is that how do, what do we do about the conquest ethic of the past? And here there are two options. There are two options. One option is we establish equal rights under the law. That was the solution of the civil rights movement, that we have had race-based discrimination, we've had racial hierarchy. Let's stop. Let's treat people according to the color of this, according to the content of their character. <laughs> Equal rights under the law. <laughs> Equal rights under the law. The other option, which you're defending, is you could essentially call it, let's correct for history. Let's correct for history. Let's try to find out who are the people in possession of stolen goods, and let's return it. Now, the first thing I'm trying to say is, 
This is a hugely controversial principle because it actually involves wrecking the freedom of a free society. You basically have to, to put it frankly, if we were to carry that out, go into people's homes and take their stuff, take their furniture, take their cars. You don't seem to have even the guts to do that. You don't have the moral self-confidence to do it yourself. It may be, if I am advocating a rule of social justice and I'm advocating it for the whole society, before I persuade everybody else, let's say I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Christian and I believe everybody should give 10% of their wealth to help the poor. And I go, you know what? There, the Bible says this, the Bible says that everybody should give 10% of their wealth to help the poor. And somebody says, Dinesh, are you giving 10% of your wealth? And I'm like, actually no, but I did do some tutoring. And you go, wait a minute, aren't you advocating? Aren't you saying that there is a moral duty to do this? Why don't you do it? Before you convince us, you do it. And you're like, I don't think I should do it because society is extremely complex. And I don't think I should do it unless everybody else does it. No. Either you believe in it and you do it. Once you've done it, you might impress us. And then you might convince the rest of us that our wealth is also ill-gotten. But you can't do it. And I'm not trying to indict everybody of hypocrisy. Only you. Because, because you're, the one, you're the one who said, I'm the beneficiary of illicit privilege. So you're a really good starting point. Because I'm asking, if you're in possession of stolen goods, why aren't you willing to return them? So that's why fundamentally I see your charity. You know, during the Civil War there was a guy who goes, I'm very happy to give, th I've given three cousins to the war and I'm ready to sacrifice my wife's brother. <laughs> that's basically your ethics. You're willing to have social justice if other people pay, but you're not willing to pay. So that's the problem. And that's the problem with the progressivism that marches behind social justice while protecting its own privileges. You know how you said, we all have to survive. Really? You have to be at Amherst to survive? You don't have to be at Amherst to survive. You have to be at Amherst to benefit. You have to be at Amherst because you're getting opportunities at this college that many other people are not getting. So if you say you believe in equal opportunity, you're a hypocrite. Because you are taking advantage of opportunities unavailable to others. But for you, this hypocrisy is fully justified because you are militating on behalf of the poor. But if, it's, if, if you are against privilege, this college is privilege. So there's a glaring hypocrisy and you will never turn your moral mirror on yourself to say, what am I doing about it? That's my point. For you, society should act before you do to enforce your moral code. Let's take a couple more questions and then we'll close. Uh, good evening, D D Dinesh. I want to compliment you. I think thought it was an outstanding speech, and that you really, uh, you really delivered uh, uh, fairness. And I think you were very uh, right on with talking about the um, the people that are doing well, people that um, aren't doing well. I believe everybody in this room m means well. I don't think anybody here really wants to discriminate or do anything like that. I don't think that's really the core of the people in this room or in America. I think people want to do the right thing. I think a lot of people in politics today stand behind that social, what you said, that injustice, well, let me take money over here because it's for these people over here. Capitalism is now a bad word. It's now a bad word, which shouldn't be. Our many heroes uh, and our successful business people like have 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 started from uh, being a janitor and worked their way all the way th all the way up. Today, they're penalized for being a successful business person, penalized for being a successful entrepreneur. If there's any there's discrimination in the past, it's I don't know how you you would. Um, repair that. I don't know how the, the correct way to, to, to do that other than move forward and to try to balance the, the, the playing field now. But I believe that if we keep doing what we're doing now, which is to penalize the people that are successful, that the people that are that are over here that could be successful, there won't be any incentive to get there. You look at the tax code, there's a penalty for people to earn more money. If there's discrimination, there's discrimination in the tax code. The more you make, the more they take. So you get penalized for. So you get penalized. Excuse me. Excuse me. We didn't talk. We, we, we the reason penalized. they're laughing is they feel they should take more. You get penalized for. That's doing, why they're you laughing. Get, because you're wrong. 
<laughs> well, well, maybe we can have an intelligent discussion without bashing each other. Yeah. Maybe you just listen to each other's sure, viewpoint. Sure, you sound so civilized. Right? Were you a janitor, sir? I've done other jobs oh, similar to being a janitor. Were you a janitor, sir? I cut grass. I d wash Wait. dishes. Speak. Okay. My would you let? Would you? Would you? Would you let me speak? Okay. Thank please, you very much. Yeah, Thank you very much. When people ask for fun, fundraisers when they go to charities, they normally don't ask a poor person. They ask a successful, wealthy person. There's a lot of wealthy, good people that are out there giving money and have earned the right where they are. To be penalized for being out there, I think, is wrong in society and sends the wrong message to these young people here that could work. Every, each and every one of you can achieve greatness and could be successful in, in any area of life that you pursue. Anybody here could be successful as an entrepreneur. I believe that a lot of politicians are using that to gain personal gain of Elizabeth Warren going after businesses and, and being successful is bad. And we need to help the, the, the people over here. And these entrepreneurs are very, uh, they, 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 they're the bad people. When really, there's a lot of good people. There's a lot of bad poor people. There's a lot of bad successful people. But the, I've never seen it before in America. I'm 55 years old where you see people that to be successful or to be an entrepreneur or to be a capitalist, you are now labeled as something bad, that, that you, you've done something wrong. And I think that if we continue along that path, I see a downward spiral in, in America. My question to you is, if we continue the same route that we're on, which is giving more, taking away the incentive for, for people, uh, penalizing people that, to be successful, where do you see America if we continue along the same path that we're on right now, Dinesh? I, I think the core of the issue here um, is that America was built by people who made their own luck. Who made their own luck. Now, the problem is that we now live in a society where luck, luck, is seen as a disadvantage. Luck is a disadvantage. Here's what I mean. A hundred years ago, most Americans worked on farms. Farming was the way of life. And then pretty soon it became such that with machines and technology, and we see this today, one guy with a bunch of headphones and a big tractor can farm 500 acres by himself. The truth of it is we don't need 70% of Americans to work on farms. We need about 2%. Now all those people who worked on farms, whatever happened to them? Basically, they had to get off their butts and get off the farm. This was not easy. It was not their fault. It was not their fault that somebody invented a tractor. It was not their fault that technology made their jobs obsolete. But there was a flinty, uncomplaining American character that said, you know what? We got to get off the farm. And there wasn't an Obama around to say, hey, listen, you don't have to get off the farm. The greedy fat cats and, and who are flying airplanes, they're keeping, they're the ones who are responsible for your misery. You know, the problem to me with Obama isn't, isn't that, he, that he's not right that there are people who are frustrated and angry. They're frustrated and angry because of immigration, technology, globalization, huge forces in our economy. But the truth of the matter is a lot of stuff that people used to make can be made more cheaply abroad. It's made more cheaply abroad by people who have a lot lower standard of living and are working a lot harder for a lot less and are making their lives better. Now, this is not an easy problem to solve. But the progressives have no solution to it except to scapegoat the successful guy that pretend like the greedy CEO is the one responsible for why all the travel agents are out of a job. Not the internet, because they don't have the guts to outlaw the internet. And not immigration, because they don't have the guts to say they don't want more immigrants here. And not free trade, because they don't have the guts to say that they are willing to take some job away from some poor guy in Thailand or Indonesia who's scraping for a living. They don't have the guts to say any of that. So they pretend to themselves and to everybody else. Oh. It's the greedy capitalists who are taking it all. They're the bad guys. It's a complete fraud. But it's a fraud that feeds their own envious psyche. It, it enables people to, to, to cope with failure. Very hard to cope with failure. In a meritocratic society, there's nothing harder than competing than, than dealing with failure because you ran a fair race and you lost. Sorry. And now you, ha you have to figure out, you don't want to say I suck. So you're very open to the guy who tells you the race was rigged. It wasn't rigged. We all start on the same line. 
Oh, but wait a second. Wait a second. We didn't start on the same line because after all, this guy has a Nordic track in his basement. That guy has a better coach. But wait a minute. A fair race is not one in which in the Olympics you investigate the, the social backgrounds of every competitor to figure out they had an equal chance to come first. <laughs> That's stupid. A fair race is one in which you draw a straight line, a clock goes on, a gun goes off, and the guy who hits the finishing tape gets the medal. Even That's a fair race. Lost, right? Even if what? Even if he's taking drugs. Not if he's taking drugs. <laughs> We're not talking about drugs. We're talking about, I'm only using an analogy, ma'am. The, uh, the analogy is to a competitive market. You didn't even get what I said. You didn't even get what I said. It's okay. Keep going. Um, you didn't even get it. <laughs> uh, I, I, I think it kind of went under my head. I'm really sorry. Uh, so, but let's take, let's take, thank you for your question. Nash, thank you very much. I think you did an outstanding job. I'll take one more question and wrap it up. You, sir. Um, I'd like to thank you for coming and uh, entertaining this envy consumed group of liberals like us. Um, I know most. I, I, no, but genuinely, I do appreciate you taking the time. Um, I wanted a couple clarifications on your understanding of our history with Native Americans. You said first earlier in the speech that it's not a genocide on the basis that we came with diseases that are responsible for a large proportion of the deaths of Native Americans, and I agree with that statement. However, I think you cannot reduce all of the deaths of Native Americans to our bringing diseases from Europe to the American continent. Um, on December 29, 1890, in the Battle of Wounded Knee, the 7th Cavalry Regiment massacred the Lakota, 150 Lakota tribe members as, as the culmination of a, long, of a long going effort to take their land. So that's my first thing. I would want to know if, in your opinion, that is or is not an act of genocide. Um, my second question, because I think this might relate to the way you attempt to address the first one, is that you've justified the conquest of lands on the grounds that that is the way it's been throughout history. And therefore, it is just in one historical period because it, was, it happened you know, throughout history. And so I want to ask if the United States right now goes to the Congo and invades them and colonizes them, in 200 years, is that a justified act? And if not, by what logic? Thank you. OK. It's a very good question. And, I, and I, let me uh, say that this has been a, a, a very good, this has been a very good evening because my goal in coming here was not to sell you on America, but this is a very smart campus and I wanted to sort of cross swords with you. And if I've been speaking in a provocative way, try to understand that I feel that this is an education that, and you'll be the test of this, you're not sufficiently getting at Amherst. In other words, it was John Stuart Mill, who said 150 years ago, that liberalism needs a strong conservatism to keep it honest, to keep it in check, to apply intellectual and moral pressure against it, so that liberalism itself can vindicate itself and defend itself. All right, so that's a little bit of what I'm trying to do. Quite honestly, this is something that should be done from your faculty. Can you answer the question about the Native Americans? Certainly. Thank you. Now, if you look at American history, there have been a whole series of disasters and crimes that have been committed from the beginning. Um, the Spanish conquistadors, to be sure. There were violent raids by Indian tribes that massacred hundreds, in some cases thousands. Now, here's something very interesting. You, in order to show genocide, have taken the wide swath of American history you don't take the Apaches wiping out the Hopis. You found something in which 150 American Indians were killed, and your microscope went right there. It's not the only event. Uh, I'm not saying it's the only event, but it's the only event you mentioned. It is. That's true. Right. And, and I'm suggesting that when we, when, we, when we make our arguments, we not only focus on the fact in question, but the principle of selectivity according to which certain facts are chosen because they fit a thesis and other facts excluded. Well, I would say it's time permitting because I wanted to make this a quick and sparse speech to give you time to respond. So I right. could have gone through maybe 20, 30 examples of white okay. Americans. Okay, but let's take, Americans. right, you didn't. you didn't. No, I didn't. Uh, right, and in fact, and in fact, that full-scale evidence, which, which in a sense makes the whole, a true indictment, if you truly wanted to show that there has been a white massacre of the Indians, 
that is, for example, incomparable to Indian massacres of each other. Oh, hold on. Oh, white massacres of each other. For example, look at World War II. I would call that white on white crime, right? A massive <laughs> massacre of whites by whites, right? Hold on. Here's my point. A true ledger would take American Indian deaths, would subtract the, Amer the number of deaths from measles, tuberculosis, etc., would have a reasonable estimate of what proportion of American Indians were killed in massacres of the kind you described. So for example, there were many millions of American Indians on this continent. You have named a single offense that numbers 150. Let's assume that you can give 10 of those examples. We're now at 1,500. 1,500 out of 8 million. Here's what I'm trying to, here's what I'm trying to say. Not, it's not called nitpicking. It's called bogus math. Can I say that in my opinion, Sorry. one death would be a, a lot. You know, I mean, I think one murder is a lot. And maybe that numerically isn't true, but I do feel that. And so when you say 1,500 murders, I do feel like that's a big deal to me, historically. So if somebody shot one guy, that's as bad as the Holocaust? It's not as bad. It is bad, though. It is bad. Yeah. But is it genocide? That's, that's a semantic distinction. You know, semantic? I, I will, no, I'll grant you that it's not genocide. Let's, let's change the question. Is it a justified act? Right. I, it's obviously, if a guy wants to rob a grocery store and shoots the clerk, it's not a justified act, but okay. neither is a genocide. Was the killing of the Indians Yes. Justified? Was that a justified act? Of course act? not. The okay. killing of the Indians was not justified. Look, all I'm trying to say, I'm not... We're misunderstanding each other a little oh, bit no, here. I know what you're trying to say. You're absolutely correct. I'm not a liberal, let me tell you. And I'm sure as hell not a Republican. Uh, Ma'am, I'm really not sure what you are at this point, but... <laughs> but I don't think we need more self definition on your part. It doesn't really matter because I'm not trying to put you down like you're trying to put other people down. I'm not, I'm not putting anyone. Yes, you are. That's part of your performance. That's, that's part of your performance. And I do, what you're saying is, and let me just clarify just because I'm not really understanding. What you're saying is, is that because it has happened, because the Indians did it to each other, why are we passing judgment on the white man having done it to the Indians? Is that part of your argument? Of course not. The part of my argument is this. You said that before. Hold on. No. The reason, the reason for making these equivalences is not to say one bad deed justifies another. It is to say two things. One is, let's keep a sense of proportion. So if it was wrong to kill 150 guys over here, it would be very wrong to kill 3,000 guys over here. But, and, I'm sim and that's number one. The second point is this. If conquest is the way of the world, and it's going on, and quite frankly, Christopher, uh, Christopher Columbus never got to America. He never touched the American, he touched the continent, but he never touched the United States. Why are we so eager to import the Spanish conquistadors into the American history, if not to continue our indictment of the white man? Here's the point I'm trying to make. The United States came up with something that's an alternative to conquest, which is wealth creation and exchange by trade. Now, trade is a real alternative to conquest because in trade, and this I think is the point that was made a little bit earlier about business, in trade, nobody can take your money if you don't give it. In trade, uh, you know, here's, here's, here's a remarkable piece of trade. Here's my iPhone. So Bill Gates, uh, so uh, Steve Jobs puts this out there. But I've got to go to the store and put out 300 bucks to get my iPhone. If it wasn't worth $300 to me, I wouldn't do it. So he hasn't ripped me off. Trade is an alternative to jobs coming in with aristocrats and beating me and taking my $300. So here's my point. So we have replaced the conquest ethic with a trade ethic. And what I'm saying now is that in a perverse twist of history, the progressives are blaming the trade ethic itself as a form of conquest. Whereas actually, it is the solution and alternative to it. That's really the argument I want to leave you with. And that is that capitalism, far from ripping anybody off, is actually a way of giving you the value of what your actual services are. Was capitalism not around at the time that we were taking this land and enslaving these bodies? Was that not a driving force in that decision? You're saying capitalism comes after that as a replacement for that, correct? I'm saying that, I'm saying that the, the greedy, acquisitive, conquistador mentality is part of human nature. It's okay. actually in you and me, okay? No, it's in you. It's in you. It's in me, but not in you. No, it's not. Really? Yeah, really. Yeah, so, so you just... You can't figure me out. Right, exactly. Because you're, I'm just, 
I'm simply unable to comprehend your saintliness. I get it. It's great. I get it. That I'm more intelligent than you. Really? I, I thought you were merely holier. No. <laughs> holier and more intelligent. Not holier. Okay. Not all right. <laughs> I, I, yeah, all right. Here's the point. The point is that the point is that capitalism comes along and the conquest ethic is all around us and it's going on. And capitalism can't defeat it and can't defeat it immediately because capitalism by itself is not a violent force. The only way, frankly, to defeat conquest is by conquest. No, so how did Lincoln defeat the conquest ethic of the South? You're missing my question. My question is, was capitalism not a part of that conquest? You know, a part of that enslavement of bodies in order to make profit. Was capitalism That's completely right. separable from that is what I was asking you. I'm saying that the ethic of capitalism was completely separate. And, and the reason we know that is that the South was a viciously anti-capitalist society. The South hated capitalism. The defenders of slavery denounced it as being a form of northern exploitation. Read George Fitzhugh. He talks about, he endorses Marx's concept of wage slavery. And he basically goes, wage slavery is worse than real slavery. Because he says in wage slavery, you don't even look after your workers. This is George Fitzhugh, the great defender of southern agrarianism. Did he write this? This was in the 19th century. The um, point I'm trying to get at is the South defended the ethics of agrarianism, hierarchy, and anti-capitalism. So, again, read history. Uh, and history doesn't refute what you think, but it produces a more rich and nuanced picture. Guys, listen, I've kept you too long. And I know I've annoyed some of you, and that was completely my intention. Um, because one doesn't tend to examine one's own convictions unless provoked. So, glad to do it. Thank you for inviting me, guys. Good night.